session as people we'll come uh, by actually getting a little chanting going and Kabir is going to tell us a little bit about what this chat is that we're going to be chanting together to open our second set. Uh, Kabir, you, okay. you want me to move things as you talk well, about your chat? Just in moderating, I didn't want to be behind a post. Well, I don't need this. <laughs> Can you hear me? Just barely? Good. So thank you. We've been asked uh, to begin with a chant, a zikr, a Sufi chant. I think it's good to have a little explanation of what it means. There's a beautiful word in our tradition. We call it the pronoun of divine presence. And it is simply who. Actually, the Tibetans were using that quite a bit. And it's literally a pronoun from Arabic, but it applies to the divine presence, which is the foundation of being, the, the source, uh, that which animates us. And sometimes this chant, and I've never done this before, but it seems right today. The chant is simply, Illahu, simple, Illahu. And this chant is usually only done at the end of a long zikr, after you've done la ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah, la ilaha illahu, and then it comes to illahu, illahu. And it means only God, just the divine presence. Um, I think this is, was an important theme for Thomas and for us this weekend. So goes like this. And by the way, it's really beautiful if you put your hearts into it and don't hold back and, uh, you know, use your voices. Be generous with your voices. So it's like this.
back in the day when I was sitting with Thomas in the Swimmers Conference, I would often wonder, because everybody there was an experienced meditator and they were very comfy with silence. Many people are not. And I was wondering to myself back then, well, if we all did something together that was kind of liturgical, what would it be? But then I realized that everybody came from different traditions, and they all used the names of their deities in their, in their meditations. So then later, as we were doing spiritual paths, and teaching to lots of different people, I began wondering, well, what is it we could do that would be a meditation that could be, could be neutral, so to speak? It could be non-sectarian, that could be universal, in which each individual in the meditation could add their own. And then we could rest into this marvelous diversity of everybody in the room. Diversity, which is the one truth we know about the world, is diversity. Diversity being required for the existence of any individual, any species, and indeed all the religions in fact, began within a diverse environment. So as we, I worked with our core team, I began to experiment. Well, what do we have in common and what would a meditation look like? And it seemed to me that it would be process-oriented meditation rather than a goal-oriented. It opened up that each individual doing it could provide their own metaphysic. They could provide the name of their own God or God, no God. They could be an atheist, they could be an agnostic, they could be of any particular tradition, but it would give them something of this diverse group that they could all do together. So what emerged out of it was, and after a lot of experimenting with our teachers and trying this at the end of our programs, we came up, I came up with these seven things. <coughs> And as a little tune, or a little mantra, it goes, may we be happy and healthy. May we be grateful. May we be transformed. Loving and compassionate. Mindful through our breathing. Wise through meditation. May we be in service to all. So what I'm going to do is just for um, about a minute and a half for each of these, maybe two minutes each, just to give you a little taste of it. I'm going to ring the, the bell between each one and then I'm going to say what it is and your job from, the, from whatever you're gathering together, from your tradition or what you're learning, wisdom from various traditions, your job is to fill in <coughs> the silence, but to in yourself, you're pulling together your meditation <coughs> in each time. And we're all the beneficiaries of the grand diversity of those with whom we're gathering. and healthy. What is happiness and what is health? For you, what are the foundations for true happiness and health? For you, what's the power and the value of meditation practice to help you to become happy and healthy? Contemplate, please, as you say to yourself, may I be happy and healthy.
May we be grateful. We all know that when we wake up each morning in a state of gratitude, we're a lot happier and the day starts much better than when we wake up with stress and fear and anxiety and pessimism. Now, imagine all the reasons for which you have to be grateful. The easy ones, the profound ones, the teachers and the teachings that provided you with a foundation for your life. Say to yourself, may I be grateful. Bring all those things to mind. May we be transformed. This very precious life that we have, and all the years that we have left in this life, or days, we don't know. What's the grandest goal that you have? Who's the person you most long to be? What are the principles, the values that you most want to embody? Towards which you are now vowing to yourself to transform yourself into that this meditation can help you to that end. May I be transformed. May we be loving and compassionate. We all know that love and compassion <coughs> are the keys to happiness for those around us and for ourselves. That love and compassion are the gateways into the true spiritual path, gateways into a profound meditation practice, not just for ourselves, but for the benefit of others. It might help you to imagine, bring to mind now, 
of that being in your life for whom you have unconditional love. True love. Feel that. Feel that permeate the whole of your body, every cell of your body. Feel it centering in your heart. And feel that love and compassion radiating out as broadly as you can imagine it. So that you might love others the way you love that most precious being in your life. May we be mindful through our breathing. Mindfulness is the gateway, the foundation for profound meditation. We focus on our breath. Fine, we find breath, our chi, our prana. Feeling it as it goes from the tip of our nostrils into our lungs, into our heart, our consciousness riding along. And we have pure focus on our breath. We experience the calm of breathing. experience breath, if you will, as, as a sacred source of our life. this meditation, a wisdom often called Sophia, Gnosis, Prajna, Chokma, Ikma, in various traditions. It's a kind of transcendent love, transcendent wisdom of that divine truth with whatever way you experience it from within your tradition. Feel that divine wisdom permeating our every in the whole of our being. service to others. Now we imagine the coming day. We imagine those predictable moments that are difficult, stressful, upsetting, the people with whom we're having challenges. We preload them, as it were, into our consciousness and into each of those we infuse this meditation. So that each of these challenging moments in the coming days become opportunities, they become objects of our gratitude 
an opportunity to deepen in our practice, an opportunity to serve even those with whom we have the most difficult times. May we be happy and healthy. May we be grateful. May we be transformed. Loving and compassionate. Mindful through our breathing. Wise through meditation. May we be in service to all. Video clip. I'll prepare for the next video. You've got the chat, I'll respond. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. And cue the second video, please. And let her rip. Actually, uh, the contemplative dimension going through right now a profound spiritual renewal, which is part of a more general movement that, that I attribute to the divine love, which is uh, inviting people throughout the world across all boundaries, geographical, religious, racial, ethnic, sometimes in ways that people can't even articulate, to, to a deeper meaning in life, a deeper uh, experience of union with the ultimate reality, or God, as we call that reality in the Judeo-Christian tradition. In our time, this, this insight of all the great mystical people and teachers of the world's history has been reinforced in many ways not in a way that uh, exactly strengthens your faith, because faith is always a gift, but in a way that helps us to see how congruent the great insights of the mystics are with the reality that science is now beginning to unveil. So I feel like somebody who, uh, even though I don't look like it, is a surfer on a, on a tide that's coming in, and I'm riding this wave of interest in, in a deeper meaning in life. And uh, I don't know where it will take me and everybody else, but all we know is we're going. And, uh, we're, and uh, I look forward to taking as many people with me as want to surf this particular tide that is coming in. And the fact that you're here tonight Whatever particular a, a, a discipline or religion you, you feel identity with, uh, you are uh, you're joining hands and hearts and minds with, with many other people who are in their own way doing the same thing. Probably humanity is on the verge of, of a great uh, movement into into, in the intuitive level of human nature, if not beyond it. And, and we are just a, a particular people at a particular time who, who by our lives and deaths, hopefully, can serve this greater movement of, 
of humanity into a, a more uh, mature and, and uh, profound way of relating to the ultimate reality and of translating that into values for society and the healing of, of a broken world in, in so many ways. I think I can speak for the other teachers, uh, at least for most teachers, that the, the, the secret of service for the world, if you're interested in uh, ecology and uh, social justice and peace, is just to be sure that you establish a solid spiritual practice in your own life. Without that, I think you're wasting your time. Because if you succeed too well, you'll get burnt out without a deep inner union with God and, and interior resources. And, uh, and so the, uh, there's a delicate moment in which, or balance between the inner life that we're we're uh, opening ourselves to in prayer and in meditation and uh, action. Action that comes from the same place that we get to in meditation is the most effective action. It, it's detached. It knows how to wait. It knows how to fail. It knows how to be devastated by results without getting discouraged. And that's because it's rooted in a hope that is beyond anything in this world or nothing can, can squash it because it's rooted in that which is the source of everything that is and invincible. Of our panelists. I'm sitting here. Yeah. I'll move it a little bit. The joys of being the youngest. our panelists, I know that both David and Ted have been teachers in the tradition of centering prayer. I don't know a whole lot more other than that you've been students of the Master. Um, and Thelina has an organization called Gravity in Indianapolis now? That's where I'm from, but I live in Omaha now. Oh, living in Omaha now. Uh, doing, helping people with spiritual direction. Um, <clears throat> and we have Bree, who has been part of the group of young contemplatives, as, as was Felina, and is also, I think, a songwriter, singer, something like that. Yeah? That's a thing that happened once. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, four beautiful souls. And the subject now is an essential one. It's about the self, a problem we all have, and an opportunity we all have. Rumi says something interesting. He says, don't go away, come near. Don't be faithless, be faithful. Find the antidote in the venom come to the root of the root of yourself. You were born from a ray of God's majesty and have the blessings of a good star. 
Why suffer at the hands of things that don't exist? Come, return to the root of the root of yourself. So this thing, this self, is both the problem and the remedy. Um, and all of spirituality is about what are we going to do with this self? We could ask the question, what is it for? We could ask the question, what is the goal of all spirituality? Some people will say, annihilate the self. Some people will say, arrive at no self. Well, we have as a specimen, if I may say so, the life of Father Thomas Keating. And some of you have been close to him on his journey right up to the end and perhaps learn something about Father Thomas's relationship to the self and how he dealt with it and what he did with it. Um, so this is just a brief introduction of an endless subject. I said earlier today, a whole weekend could be on this subject alone. Um, so who would like to begin? Perhaps uh, I could share a couple of the uh, wisdom sayings or anecdotes, uh, a few of them that uh, Father Thomas left me these last years, uh, and I think I shared these all with our group this morning and last night in some way. Uh, if you know Father Thomas's story, story of his journey. Um, he was an abbot of a large monastery in Massachusetts for 20 years and tried to initiate reform in that monastery, including, as Cynthia said earlier, uh, interspiritual dialogue. And uh, it was a very challenging period for him because a lot of the monastic community were not uh, feeling drawn in that way. So uh, he suffered quite a bit because this was his commitment as abbot to serve the best needs of the monks that were under his, uh, that he was responsible for in some way, spiritually. Um, so I met him after he had retired from uh, being abbot and he was living here in uh, Snow Mass at St. Benedict's Monastery. Uh, so I met him after all of that suffering, uh, which was quite, uh, quite a crucible for him. A dark night, he called it. And he told me once in those early years that he had been brought to the point of even considering uh, not being a monk anymore because his identity had been stripped his sense of uh, self and the role and the responsibility that he had assumed had been offered to God over and over again. And he thought, well, what's left for me? He was living in a new monastery and uh, folding the laundry uh, at the guest house. And he thought that he might not become a monk or it might not be a monk anymore. But he said, that he stayed a monk, obviously, that's his story, uh, because he felt that was the way he could help the most people. Even though his identity was not tied up into that role, that, that, uh, that uh, sense of self, um, he could still live it out in a way that was very meaningful. He was still a very committed monk. But he found that his identity, I felt, was more and more about serving other people and doing the most he could to help other people. So his transformation of selfhood was caught up in something much bigger. So by staying a monk, he could communicate uh, the contemplative values outside the monastery, which is where he was drawn uh, to renew contemplative life outside the monastery enter into new forms of interreligious dialogue and uh, 
I think many of us are the great beneficiaries of that decision. Uh, he helped us. He helped me in that way. Um, a second little wisdom saying I remember um, him offering to me in the last few years. So I had a lot of contact with him for uh, 30 or 30 some years. And then the last five years, uh, uh, I moved to uh, the Northwest, the Pacific Northwest, and uh, because of, partially because of health reasons and uh, big challenges in my life, being stripped of my identity. Um, and he told me once, he said, uh, he said, I know you're challenged uh, with health issues and you're suffering in your own way. He said, but if you can find a way uh, to stay engaged, stay in contemplative service within the uh, limitations or, the, or within the, the lifestyle that you have. He said, pay attention to what you can do and how you might feel better by doing it. So his wisdom saying was, you know, be aware of the limitations that I have and what, what's there for me at this time of my life. I couldn't travel any longer. I couldn't give retreats. I couldn't really write another book. Um, but he said, if you can find a way to still be engaged in contemplative service, watch what it does for you and see if it frees you in some way. So those of us who were his students know that he was a great teacher on contemplative service self-forgetful service, and that's been already shared and witnessed here today. To me, the same abandonment and the same dedication that he lived between himself and God in prayer and meditation, he also lived in the world when he was throwing himself away in service. Contemplative service, he said, was God in us serving God and other people. So to pay attention to the way that we could do that, the way that I could do that, within the confines and the conditions of my own life, how I could embrace action and service in a self-forgetful way, so that God in me was serving God and other people, uh, was a great wisdom teaching. And again, this is a, a way uh, to forget the self and find freedom and liberation. And this is his path. And it included, as was already uh, mentioned, uh, a good deal of pain and suffering at the end of his life. He was very, very active for decades, decades, traveling all over the world, um, caring for uh, institutions and people, sharing this message of uh, contemplative prayer and contemplative service, interreligious dialogue. And then in the last uh, seven or eight years of his life, he couldn't do that anymore. He was left here at the monastery, uh, alone in a cell, confronting a lot of pain, and physical pain and suffering, like Pat said. But that became his way of prayer, the offering of his pain and his suffering in the mystery of God, the God in him that was serving the God in other people, the God in us. So if, you're been, if you were involved uh, with his work in contemplative outreach or interreligious dialogue, you can perhaps recognize the way that he committed, even in the solitude of his cell, to offer through his heart his selfless service through the pain and the suffering. And when I read Mother Teresa of Calcutta, um, her letters and her diaries, when she talked about her own spiritual darkness and the lack of, of consolation she felt. Very animated, incredible person. I met her uh, once and was profoundly affected by her. But in her inner life, she was in a, a dark night most of the time. And when I read her letters and thinking of Father Thomas uh, and his example, I thought, She's doing the same thing that I know Thomas is doing. Is that he's offering uh, for those people who have been touched by his message, his spiritual children, as a spiritual father would do, his own 
life and its own humanity and its own uh, pain in order to liberate um, his message and seed as Mother Teresa did, I think, uh, the order that she founded in order to uh, take on in some transformative way uh, the burden and the challenges that uh, a community can uh, experience and transform it. I'm getting a little dry here. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, the last little uh, wisdom saying uh, that came alive to me uh, was last year, a, a year ago, when um, my wife Donna and I traveled to Massachusetts to see him before he died. He was in the infirmary, and uh, really in his last, we thought it was his last days, but he lived a while longer. Um, and I was honestly expecting him to be in a lot of physical pain. And with this incredible heart that he had, a bodhisattva's heart, uh, centered in Christ and Christ's love for the world. I thought that he might be in this place of, of, of suffering and offering his uh, pain to God. Uh, but we visited with him for two days, and that's not what I saw. I saw him so happy, so human, so joyful, so uh, excited to see us, to see me. I told the group that um, Don and I walked in, and uh, I mean, he knew me as kind of like a monk for so long, <coughs> almost a monk. <laughs> and uh, and uh, he knew me in the last 15 years as uh, his spiritual son who got married to a uh, an embodiment of the Shekinah, the Divine Feminine. Um, and so uh, Donna said to him, well, I'll let you guys talk alone. You know, I'll, I'll leave you guys alone. And he said, oh no, you're not leaving. Said, I, I, it'll be boring, just the two of us guys. <laughs> he said, I want to hear what you've been doing with your spiritual humor. And the three of us joked <laughs> and told stories. And, uh, and laughed, and also uh, remembered uh, our time together, 35 years, uh, offered forgiveness, he and I, to each other, uh, embraced and cried, but also laughed a lot. Uh, so the last encounter I had with him was meaningful in so many ways, but it, it also shattered my idea in one final encounter with my spiritual father about what I might expect to experience, you know, the offering of his suffering to the world. No, what was being offered through him in those moments was radiant joy and a deep penetration of his humanity and our human relationship, which was a wonderful teaching for me. So uh, to me, that's sometimes what manifested out of his oneness was a uh, joy, playfulness, There's, and he loved to play with, uh, dance upon seriousness and uh, ego attachment, including his own, if you remember him well. Um, and at times, pain, passing through his body, emotional pain, um, he had healed his own uh, psychological wounding, as happens, on the spiritual journey to some uh, meaningful degree, but I've always been struck by the realization that not every neurosis is healed. And I don't think that's the point of the spiritual journey. Um, and so to be able to dance with neuroses and to be able to uh, experience openness and humanity and dependence on God, whether it's joy or suffering, to have the commitment to give ourselves away to other people in service because that's the way we can help other people, whatever the circumstances of our lives are, 
these are some of the messages that were reinforced in my relationship with him the last few years of his life. Um, when I didn't get to see him hardly at all, just spoke to him once every few months on the phone and saw him maybe once a year before I was with him a lot. Um, so he was very intrigued by the idea of no self. Uh, early on when I first met him, I felt that he was struck by that Buddhist understanding because no self uh, is not a strong uh, understanding or realization in Christian mysticism. Um, but what he grew to appreciate about what happens to the self is not that the self is wiped out, um, but the self as a fixed point of reference is diminished. That's what I saw in him. There was no fixed point of reference for his identity, but it came up and changed in moment to moment experience, whatever was appropriate to do in that moment. If it was to be joyful and laughing and happy, because that's what his spiritual son needed to learn, that's what he did. If it was to tell a story, uh, about his early monastic life and how he was discerning what to do in his life, that's what he did. If it was to penetrate the depths of human suffering and pain, he was willing to do that and not be trapped in any fixed point of reference that would translate that experience into a dualistic self and other. Even his experience of God, praying to God, was no longer dualistic, it was deeply unitive. So I just wanted to offer those little experiences. Thank you so much, David. Beautiful. Who would like to come next? Switch microphones. Reflecting back on our experience that day when um, Father Thomas's suffering became a portal of profound compassion and um, oneness. I, I've been thinking a lot about, you know, the relationship between self and suffering and um, this inherent tension of life. There is between you and me a space, there is between you know, down to the subatomic and the quarks, there's this spaciousness and tension between all things. There's a relationship there that creates a spaciousness, right? And in that relationship, there is this inherent tension and longing, almost like an engine, you can feel it. Going back to the lovers, you know, when the beloved is gone, it is suffering, you know? It's just this ache, this longing. And so I think one of the things that I'm pondering as a gift from Thomas is the ways in which relationality is the very structure of everything, the very foundation of how things are created. Friction, tension is both what happens in suffering and what happens in pleasure and in joy. And both of them seem to be the ground of creativity, the movement of creativity, the movement of our shared becoming, right? And as I think about selfhood, and I think about that spondic energy, that, that phrase from Beatrice Bruteau, I am, may you be. You know, it, it doesn't stop at I am. The I am isn't just I am. Thank you very much. I hope you all have a great time with your lives. I am, though, look at me, I'm fully attained. Isn't that awesome? It's it's deeply related to the may you be. And so there seems to be something about this deeper selfhood that is identified with the whole and can find itself in the whole. And from that place say, I am, may you be. This is the way of everything. This is how creativity happens. This is what love does. Self-emptying so that you can become. Diminishment so you may be more. And that I am, that development of that I am, 
in Father Thomas seems to be such a physical surrender to the conditions, the circumstances of suffering in his own life. And that seems to be the invitation for us that when we are able to surrender to this tension of life itself, that this is, this is somehow the way of everything, that somehow this tension, this friction, this pain, this joy, the beauty of this intensity is part of this created realm that once we can accept that and open ourselves to our circumstances and the suffering that comes through in those circumstances, then we touch upon where we connect with the may you be. I think of that, um, that phrase Ubuntu. Do you know that phrase Ubuntu? I am because we are. It's a beautiful saying. But somehow the process of suffering can open us up to this deeper selfhood when we can drop beneath the victimhood of what causes our suffering, there is a place of deep connectivity where compassion is possible. Compassion where we can suffer with one another and share in the burden of our planetary suffering and the suffering of God as our sacred calling, as you were saying, David. And I think there's something very joined between selfhood, relationality is the very structure of everything, compassion, and how that compassion then translates to skillful means, presence, the full presence that can see right action and response. Thomas had this in that experience that we had, such a radical presence, such a profound compassion, that when he spoke to us, he spoke all the way through. It came all the way down. And then in that way, we became one with him. He invited us into himself. Our suffering when embraced in the same way that we embrace our joys, can become this thing that draws us all the way down through the, the subtle levels to the very material levels, to all the way through until we can fall down into that abyss and be shattered as he was. And what I felt in that encounter with him was that his physical suffering made him so profoundly vulnerable and so tender like a child, so accessible, that shattering that he went through became the Eucharist that we partook in. This is my body, broken for you, and for you, and for you. This is my blood, shed for you. And I feel that invitation in the very precious few encounters that we had to accept the conditions of our planetary reality, to stop running away from how messy and shitty and complex this all is, but to sink beneath that until we can touch upon that common place of unity, which is compassion, that place where our suffering makes us one, that Teardian prayer, Lord, make us one, that suffering has an opportunity to bring us down to that place so that we too can live as Thomas lived and say to everyone and this whole great adventure of becoming, this is my body, my small body, broken for you. Thank you, Brie. Thank you. Suffering can be a gift to the self gift to all of us when embraced. Ted? Thomas was my uncle. My mother was his sister. 
one of the great blessings of my life was to be able to be with him much of the final month of his life. That began after he had been enrolled in hospice while he was at the um, infirmary at St. Joseph's Abbey in Spencer. He'd been in hospice for about three months. And he reached a point where he felt he was ready to die. He stopped his medication. The uh, experienced hospice nurse told him that it was a couple of days probably at the most and that's what I was when I was called that's what I uh, was told but it didn't work out that way uh, he uh, continued to to live and there, there was a lot of confusion, you know? It was like there was a message and, you know, you're dying and then it, it didn't happen. There was confusion for him. There was confusion for the people uh, who were around him. But after a while, it, it settled into just a vigil of this is what's happening, and day by day, it's continuing to happen. Um, and he, he died as a fully incarnate human being. You alluded to that earlier, uh, Bree. I mean, that, that things happen to him, they happen to everybody. There are periods of uh, delirium, there are periods of uh, Lucidity. There were periods where he was just un unconscious, uh, and th through this, there were extraordinary things that happened. I think that at least half a dozen people, including myself, would say that they had during this time, received from him uh, e extraordinary healing, life-changing spiritual gifts, some of which were translated, transmitted while he was not conscious, and that it was that life of service that you talked about, it was, it was still there. And all this was happening against a backdrop of continual physical pain for which he, uh, he didn't take any pain medication to speak of. He said it, it just didn't help him. You know, I'm, I'm, I think maybe he took four or five doses of Ativan during that whole period. And that I remember so clearly times when I would sit at the, at the foot of his bed, I could look toward him, and that he was not with me. He was not with the people in, in, in the room. His eyes were closed, and he was clearly experiencing some deep pain of, of either a, a emotional, physical, combination of both, but he was boning, softly crying out sometimes, and grimacing, and sitting just beyond his bed, I could look and just bear witness to 
what he was going through and see on the wall just over his head a crucifix and experience a certainty that whatever suffering he was enduring, he was doing it for all of us. I think this one works now. Thank you so much for sharing that personal encounter with us. I, there's so much uh, to, to try to say in the, in the topic of selfhood and suffering. I, I think what I want to try to do is um, bring together a few themes here that have popped up. If we think of the self, um, this is what I, I see in the life of Thomas. Um, a self that became a container for the divine. So uh, he was very human, right? And, and so this is what's so beautiful about the, the, the Christian icon of the, of, the, of the Christ, or the one who is um, incarnated, right? That we live, we have this invitation to be incarnated beings, uh, divinely human. And this is what I see in Thomas. And um, if I could back up, when we were at the funeral in Spencer, I, I left that with a, a profound sense of like, this can't be the end to the work of Thomas's life and death. Like, something's unfinished in terms of that process. And I, I'm so grateful that Cynthia and Ed um, really caught on to the inspiration that this needed to happen. And so by coming and gathering here together, I, I hope that we're getting to the essence of what Thomas's transition leaves for us. Uh, that in his suffering and his death, this, this broken seed um, that falls to the ground in order to bear fruit, that we could open our hearts to receive that seed planted in us. Uh, he had a particular way, and it was very uh, Christocentric and cruciform. And this way involves suffering that the self has to embrace, like Bree's saying, to embrace our suffering as much as we would embrace our joy. But our society in particular does everything possible to escape our pain. So how can we follow Thomas and not just follow him, but open our hearts to be the soil in which that broken seed is planted in us that we might follow the way of being broken open, emptied of all the parts of self that get in the way of our divine nature so that that power can come through us to transform one another and the planet in which we live. Thomas's death, to me, is a portal into this next stage of this evolutionary cosmic process that we're all in. And so if you don't hear anything else from me, please hear that the invitation is to open the heart as a soil bed for that broken seed that leads the way into this new life, new era, new way of being divinely human for a, for a world that is in desperate need of more and more and more and more examples of Thomas, right? Who, who reflects the Christ, you know? He's the one that's given so many of us so much hope because he reflects the one that is hope, that brings meaning to everything. Everything, everything, everything has meaning. And we're living in a world that's dying for meaning. But we are the ones who can bring that meaning, right? Stop there. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Selena. So the theme was the self. And what a beautiful example we have of a self 
that became a container, a vehicle for the divine, and that way fulfilled a divine purpose. We invite your contributions, comments. Uh, somebody helping with a microphone? It's over here. Um, as a student of feminist theology, I'm wondering, is anybody, is there anybody else in the room have any question about redemptive suffering, about glorifying suffering besides me? I'll take you up on that one. <laughs> Very much into woman as theology myself. I think what becomes problematic is when we identify with suffering as our identity, which is what you're naming is, is an unacceptable view and that so many, not just women, but those of, those of uh, people on the margins, POC people, LGBTQ people, find as though it's somehow a theological excuse to say great suffering is part of this path, so therefore that means we should just be okay with oppression and okay with injustice or okay with, you know, patriarchal silencing of women's voices. I'm talking to you, Catholic Church, right? So I think that there is, you know, as I was talking about suffering and what I see in Thomas, is the passing through of suffering, a non-identified flow in which not even the suffering becomes an identity to hang on to or a moment to grasp onto. Victimhood is a real thing. It's also not the truest thing about who we are. When Jesus healed people, he didn't say, you know, sorry about your situation. Apparently they're right. You're an outcast. Good luck with your life. He said, your faith has healed you. Not your faith in me, but your faith that you are not what they have said is wrong with you. You are not the societal outcast. You are not, to God, you are not those things. You are part of God with me in God. And so I think there's a subtle distinction, and I'm grateful that you're bringing it up, because embracing the path of suffering toward a, a cosmic selfhood or a, a, a unified selfhood does not mean that we somehow just become doormats to abuse or injustice, but rather that we allow our own suffering to put us in touch with the suffering of the world so that we can move into compassionate action in trying to liberate and heal just as Jesus did. That's my take on it. Thank you, Bree. Beautiful. Thank you. Right here. Just the microphone is coming to you. Oh, it's okay, I think. Um, Stand up so oh, we can see you. Okay. Uh, regarding suffering, it can become an identity. And that is the problem of that, because once it becomes an identity, then it becomes, uh, it reinforces the ego structure. And it doesn't allow for a certain uh, letting go and for a certain... Um, I always call it like autumn, you know, like the leaves of us can start falling. We don't allow that to happen because we need the suffering to continue going through. Thank you so much. I would also like to say that um, religion has its pathologies that we should be alert to. And one of them might be that suffering is the way to God, the primary way to God which is different than saying, as human beings, we inevitably encounter suffering and our spiritual life should help us to uh, transform and benefit from that suffering. Mm. Can I just see like, this morning you had some interesting things to say about the non-clinging uh, as, as, as an insight into suffering and identity. 
Does any of that make sense? Cynthia is saying that Ted may have something to say about the non-clinging to suffering. Yes, I think it's completely consistent with uh, what both of you are, 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 are saying, that the, the, the problem is in the identification and really with identifying with anything. Uh, um, the, uh, my background is in uh, Buddhist insight meditation and one of the things that the Buddha is quoted as saying is nothing whatsoever should be clung to as I or mine. And another thing that he said was that, that he, his, his teachings were about suffering and the end of suffering. And it is all about that clinging and not allowing the raw experience, any raw experience, whether it's suffering or pleasure or whatever, to pass through us without identifying with it, without wanting to want more of it or less of it, grasping, pushing away. And uh, so that, you know, I think that it, it's very consistent with what you're saying. Yeah, I, I feel there's like one more point on that, which is that, you know, in centering prayer, we can often be so mental about this letting go, letting go, letting go. And it can sometimes bypass the important step of welcoming. And so as we speak to suffering or violence um, or um, tragedy, you know, we're not saying in this letting, you know, passing through that somehow we're bypassing or saying, yep, you're supposed to just let it go. You're not supposed to feel traumatized by what happened to you. But rather we're saying that there is an invitation to hold tenderly the horror of what has happened to you or to someone, the tragedy of it. And then in the work of healing, to notice how we want to hang on to that identity in reaction and to again breathe into and soften and then allow that to pass through so that we can recover, be remembered to, be members of that larger whole identity that no violence, no tragedy, and no horror can touch. In that place, I think um, that, that deep presence and selfhood that we've been talking about in Thomas, that bod bodhisattva energy, where he could sit with us and hold us and hold our suffering. I never told while we were there, I never said to him any of the particulars of my life or the absolute shit show that was going on in the background of like, just complete disaster and falling apart and profound trauma that I was going through. Yet, I'm telling you, he knew. <laughs> he knew, and he was in it with me. And I think he took a piece of it into himself. Um, and I think that's, that's the opportunity that I hear you speaking to, Felina, so beautifully. Like, we have an opportunity to be that kind of bodhisattva energy in our world. I'd like to say a word about this life, this existence, and this something that's evolving life forms and species and, and, and creating minerals and volcanoes and oceans. What about in the invisible world, which is at least as real as the physical world, would you agree? Is it possible that this existence is like a workshop for qualities, and that only through certain conditions, including conditions of incredible human suffering, can virtues like courage, acceptance, nobility, generosity be evolved, created, manifested? Um, I... In other words, is there a purpose beyond mere non-attachment? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Hi. we have maybe oh. time for... Do you have one? I just I, uh, I want to bring something up. Let's uh, wait for the microphone. 
Thank you. I, I just wanted to say one thing. Uh, to the four of you, I would like some reflection. Uh, I heard from Thomas and, and uh, mentioned this to other people many times. Four consents that he said is necessary for a human life. Number one, consent to your basic goodness. Number two, consent to your basic sexuality. Number three, consent to your creativity. And number four, consent to diminution, which I'm in the middle of. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. How beautiful. What else? Oh. Back there? Hi. Do you have... Um, oh, I'm sorry. I just wanted to say, as I was listening to all these beautiful stories of Thomas, what kept coming up for me was the metaphor of birth and the suffering in birth and that Thomas was in this long and maybe difficult pregnancy and was giving birth to large offspring. And that's something that I think uh, everybody can relate to, the feminine in us. It doesn't have to be female or male. And, but what I just want to also underline what you said, Felina, because it feels like that child, that offspring that was birthed, has been handed over now to us and, you know, is a living being. So I just wanted to put that in there when somebody mentioned about feminine. Thank you. Kabir, I like that as a as an answer to what you just said, is the path just about non-attachment or is somehow the non-attachment and suffering of pushing that baby out part of the process of the creative adventure of becoming an evolution? Yes. Which speaks to what you said to me. Okay, back here. It's coming. Coming on your left. So my question is about identifying the false self and the difference between the, the self-inflicted pain and just the suffering that comes as part of the journey. So one of the things that Father Tom, Thomas talked a lot about was your emotions will reflect your programs for happiness. And I guess I'm just curious if there's any wisdom or any thoughts that you guys might have around identifying the false self and the distinction between what's self-imposed suffering versus what is suffering that just comes as a result of being on the, being a human on this earth. I possibly could answer, respond to this if my mind was sharper. Oh. <laughs> I can say a couple of things around, um, you know, noticing the, the false self being more of a constricted self and a, um, an adapted self, a one that is um, spending a lot of energy trying to adapt to surroundings and circumstances. And, uh, and so this, um, whenever you find yourself being um, kind of closing in and instead of opening outward, that's usually a sign that false self is, is active. Um, what was the second part of your question? It was, it was mostly about identifying the false self versus, oh, and the, one of the things Father Tom said was your, your emotional reaction to something often reflects your programs for happiness and, and your, essentially your false self. Any other tidbits of wisdom that he left with you guys around noticing what your programs for happiness are? And something that came up, yeah, something that came up in our conversations was this idea of a fixed point of reference. So the self that keeps having, trying to find a fixed point of reference, I'm this, now I'm that, I was a musician and I was really into Bono, now I'm a really good contemplative and I speak really breathy and, I, you know, all of these fixed points of selfhood, right? That's, that, that is part of that false constructed self. And I think what I hear in your question is a little bit of a, a subtle thing about how do we know when um, the suffering that we're going through is, is a suffering that is meant to be embraced or when it's this false created. Am I hearing you right? Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, that, I think that's that's good luck. That's discernment. That's <laughs> yeah. I'd like to say something. But yeah, yeah, I will. Yeah. So the finish. one thing I want to say about it is, I think part of what we're trying to weave here is that that non-referential point of uh, fixed selfhood, the, the selfhood that is true, is one that is identified as the whole, not in the particular. And I think that can sometimes help be a guide in noticing what suffering is that's coming at us, suffering that we're invited to carry, and suffering that we're creating for ourselves. That's, but I'm like with you on the journey, so, <laughs> yeah. It's okay. Come here. We're about to. All right. I got a little. I got a little cue that I used, and Father Thomas and I used to work with it. Um, um, it was less about uh, false self, and more about the experience of collapsing. So, like you know, if you're a centering prayer practitioner, you're in your sit. You have this spaciousness come out and you're trying to integrate the spaciousness and then something happens and you go from this to this and whatever it is it, you know rather than like a a great a great pasture with horses running across it it's you tied to the back of the horses just getting dragged along <laughs> But the, the actual physical experience of, of the collapse, for me, is a great cue. Because I know, oh, something, something got me. And then as soon as I recognize that I collapsed on it, I let it go again. And if I don't have a hold of it, I just let it be. The horses can run all they want across the field, no problem. But if I get collapsed on it, it drags me all over the place. So that's a helpful cue that I, that I work with Thomas with. Uh, blessings. Thank you. So it is nearly 6 o'clock, which is when we promise to end this session. Uh, so let's call this the end. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. This has been such an exquisite conversation, and I wish we didn't have to stop. Um, tomorrow morning, 9.30, there'll be this amazing interspiritual jamboree wonderful worship time. <laughs> so get here in plenty of time for 9.30. It will start at 9.30. <laughs> um, right now, the, there's a um, bookseller bookstore from town is out there with a lot of Thomas Keating's books and various of you guys who are authors, um, your books will be out there too. So do have a good old look. They'll also be back um, tomorrow at 10.30 after the service. Right now, we're going to, um, if anyone's willing just to move your, at least your chair to the side or to the back, that will help us a lot. And we're going to set up for the Zikia tonight, which is at um, 8 o'clock, which could be as leading. So other than that, we'll see you um, at 8 or tomorrow at 9.30. All right, okay, so Cynthia's asking that I say something Just about a second, folks. One second. One second. What are we doing Oh, okay. What are we doing tonight? Um, zikr is a form of chanting and movement uh, with percussion and some, some music in which we chant the names of God, in this case, in an interspiritual version. It's originally a Sufi practice, of course, but it's a practice that people in this spiritual paths community have grown to love more and more, so they asked us to do it tonight with you. Um, it's energizing, and it's primarily worship, reverence of the divine, but in a very active, dynamic form. We welcome you. <laughs>